not very successful. Hey everyone, it's Joe. I'm the Kosher Ninja, and we've been chatting about my adventure last year hiking on the Shvil Israel or Israel National Trail. If you're new here, welcome. I'm so glad you've stopped by. And while you're here, don't forget to check out my videos from the Shvil and to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified when I post new videos. But right now, we're going to talk some more about training what I did to train, and I will give you the Kosher Ninja's scientific sounding method for training for the Spiel. Now, I understand it's a difficult time to be thinking and talking about training for the Spiel. We really have no idea what's gonna happen between now and September, if there's going to be a hiking season at all, but you know, folks, we really can't let this COVID thing get us down. So even if we can't hike in September, maybe next year or the year after that. So whether you're planning for September or for 2025, I hope there's something in this video that will help you to prepare. Now, last time we talked about some of the different types of hikers that you'd find on the Shvil. We had the young Israeli ex-military type. We had the foreigner, a little bit older, experienced backpacker. We had the older Israeli experienced backpacker. And then we had the foreigner rookie, like me. A rare bird, so keep your eyes open just in case you catch a glimpse. Now, despite their differences, each of these hiker types can benefit from the Kosher Ninja's training plan. And now you want to know what that plan was. Oi, didn't I tell you I didn't actually have a plan? <laughs> yeah, again, as always, do as I say, don't do as I do. I was busy, I was working, I was starting a YouTube channel and well, you know how it goes. Anyways, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Well, that's not entirely fair or even really accurate. I did have a training regimen, but it wasn't particularly scientific or intentional or even specific to the Shvil. It was more focused on general fitness and conditioning. And fortunately for me, it did actually, I think, serve me well. The one area where I fell short was the climate. I knew it. I knew it was going to be a problem. There just wasn't a whole lot I could do about it. So I had to make do with what I had. So what was my plan? Well, it was pretty simple actually. It consisted of four years of Kung Fu training begun long before it ever entered my mind to go hike the Shvil. Five months of very basic hiking training and some targeted physiotherapy. So yes, for four years I did Kung Fu two to three times a week for a total of about three to four hours and it was the best thing I could have done. I was so busy partly because I was doing three to four hours a week of Kung Fu, that the Kung Fu actually ended up packing a really big punch in terms of payback. But we're talking about training to go hiking and hiking is basically walking. So what about the walking part? Well, about five months before my trip, I started walking whenever I could. Of course, because my schedule was so crazy, this really had to be limited to the weekends. I started with a nine kilometer walk around the block. Thanks, Jules. And no, I don't recommend starting with a nine kilometer walk, especially if you're just getting off the couch. 
start small and work up to it. I worked up to where I was aiming for 20 kilometers each weekend spread out over the two days. Unfortunately, some weekends I had to content myself with 15 to 16 kilometers on one day. But in the process, I also learned how to use trekking poles, which was an adventure in and of itself. And eventually I should have added my weighted backpack, which I didn't do, but I'm trying to give myself grace for the fact that I had a lot on my plate already. Next, wait for it, I exercised my feet. Yes, there was nothing scientific about what I did. I put together a random series of exercises that I collected or adapted from a Kung Fu buddy who teaches Pilates and a book by Katie Bowman called Whole Body Barefoot, which by the way, I highly recommend. These exercises included stretching and rolling out my plantar fascia, tenting my feet, so basically feet flat on the floor and raising the center of each foot up as high as I could, sort of from the inside or underneath, ideally without curling my toes though. Visualizing raising my navicular bones above my ankle bones. <laughs> Trying to raise three of my toes individually. All five seemed a little too ambitious. <laughs> so I started with my pinky toe, then my big toe, and my middle toe. And then I would repeat each of these exercises 15 times. Sounds hokey, doesn't it? <laughs> well, after about a week of tenting my feet and doing mental reps with my navicular bones, I suddenly found myself walking around on these tiny little muscle pillows. It was the strangest thing. Two little exercises and suddenly I have these ginormous tiny muscles that I didn't even know were possible. In addition to exercising my feet, I also knew that I had some problems with one of my hips. So I went to a physiotherapist to get some exercises and try to sort some of those issues out. So there you have it. That's what I did to prepare physically for the Schwil. But what principles should you take out of this to prepare a training regimen for yourself? Well, I think the walking and the hips and feet part are pretty obvious. Of course, before you start something like this, you should always talk to your doctor. And most importantly, know your own body and be aware of any specific issues that might arise. Then you can work with your doctor or a physiotherapist to help you focus on those parts. You're gonna be walking for two months with a heavy pack on your back. So obviously you need to strengthen those walking muscles and ligaments and joints by walking as much as you can and working up to a loaded backpack. But speaking of feet, were we speaking of feet? What about our poor little feet? When we think about training for the trail, we easily think about walking and about our thighs and calves and cardio and stamina and maybe even our back and shoulders. But did you ever stop to think that your tiny little forgotten feet are the biggest workhorse of this whole exercise? They carry your weight plus the weight of that 15 kilo pack for 20 kilometers every single day. They warn you when you're about to step on something dangerous or unstable. They get soaked when you go through water crossings. And the only time we spare a thought for our poor little miserable hardworking feet is three days into the hike when they're covered in blisters 
or that time when we don't listen to that danger sign and end up spraining a muscle we didn't even know existed. There are 26 bones in each of your feet, 33 joints, and over 100 muscles, tendons, and ligaments. 100 in one foot. That's 52 bones, 66 joints, and over 200 muscles and company in total. Wrap your mind around that for a little bit. And we don't even think that we should exercise our feet. For my part, I'm certain that my footwork paid off. True, I did end up spraining one of those 200 plus ligaments or whatever. And I also ended up with plantar fasciitis towards the end. But both of those injuries were purely and entirely my own fault. The first time I was having a bad day, being stubborn and refusing to listen to my body. And the second time I was trying to keep up with my hiker buddies against my better judgment. So go ahead, find some exercises in a book like Katie's or online or make up your own. But whatever you do, don't forget to take your feet to the gym. And now for the good stuff, the Kung Fu. This part is not so obvious, but in addition to general fitness and conditioning, it was crazy important for things like managing obstacles in technical terrain, avoiding falling off cliffs, and most importantly, not falling into cow patties. How so, you say, and now do I have to start taking Kung Fu? No, you don't have to start taking Kung Fu, but let's look at some of the principles. Let's start with upper body training. Getting back to Jill Jowman's quote in the Red Book, I think it's true that men do have a bit of an advantage in this area, but even then, I think on the whole, upper body strength is kind of the forgotten child when it comes to backpacking. After the feet, of course. Partly I think this is because it's maybe not as important on the other major trails. Ah, but what about the backpack, you say? Well, actually, the weight of the pack should be on your hips, not on your back or shoulders. So, yeah, I'm still right. But on the Schwil, in the desert and also in some of the dry wadis up north, upper body strength will make a big difference in the ease with which you manage over some of the obstacles in technical terrain. It doesn't mean you have to hit the gym until you look like Popeye, but don't neglect your upper body. If it's the only thing you do in this area, learn to do push-ups. Lots of push-ups. They're great. They're free and you can do them anywhere. In fact, with social distancing in effect, you can even do them while you're standing in line waiting to get into the grocery store. It's true, you can. You might get a few strange looks, but you can. But the really big bang for my buck from Kung Fu came with understanding leverage and body mechanics, balance, coordination, and just general body awareness. In other words, it improved my proprioception. I've always wanted to use that word in a sentence. It's a big word, but basically it just means awareness of your body in space. So in this regard, I would highly recommend that you include something in your training plan that will help with your proprioception. I would say gymnastics or martial arts, especially Kung Fu, would be particularly good at this. But anything like dance, football, soccer, basketball, anything like that would help. Hockey or baseball? Not so much. Don't get me wrong, I love hockey, 
but not for this purpose. It's too fast and the ice messes with your connection with the ground. And baseball, well, baseball is just too slow and inefficient. So if you're doing them already, don't stop, <laughs> but unless you don't have time, but don't start them thinking that they're gonna help you with your training plan for your spiel. So there you have it, the Kosher Ninja's scientific sounding method for physical conditioning for the Shvil Israel. I'm sure you could probably adapt it to any other trail as well. So to recap, make sure you start with anything that's gonna help you with general body awareness and proprioception. Then move on to general conditioning, working out your body from your toes to your fingertips, and giving special attention to any particular issues that might be unique to your body. Finally, last but also not least, don't forget to work in actual hiking training over distances, working up to a fully loaded pack. Dealing with the heat and humidity on the other hand, that's a whole nother story. So are you training for the Shvil Israel or maybe for another trail? What's your training plan? Do you still have questions? Tell me about all that in the comments section down below. If you like this video, give me a thumbs up and subscribe and ring the notification bell and share with your friends. And if you've hiked the Shvil Israel and have anything to add that might help the people who are planning or training, put that in the comments down below as well. And I'd just love to hear from you. I'm so excited that we get to share our journeys in this way and can't wait to see you again next time. Until then, thanks for watching and Shalom, eh?